Morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lieutenant Sub, and we are Group 3. We'll be briefing the U.S. Joint Space Operations. So before we start, we're going to watch a short clip. Today's agenda. So the mission, Joint Force Space Component conducts space operational level planning, integration, and coordination with other U.S. DRACOM joint functional components, of the other combatant commanders, DOD partners, and when directed, non-DOD partners to ensure unity of effort in support of military operations, national security operations, and support to civil authorities. Task organization. So the Joint Force Space Component, also known as JFSC, is a component of the U.S. Strategic Command, also known as U.S. DRACOM. It was previously known as Joint Functional Component Command for Space, but it was reorganized to JFSC in December 2017, which was a couple months ago. The key change to this, uh, the key change to this reorganization is that it elevated from a three-star command to a four-star command. The current commander is Air Force General Jay Raymond, who is also the Air Force Space Command Commander. The JFSC is comprised of four operations centers, in addition to their headquarters staff. The Joint Space Operations Center, which is also known as JSPOC, is located at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, and it provides operational command and control of worldwide Joint Space Forces, and it enables the JFSC commander to integrate space power into global, power, global military operations. The National Space Defense Center, NSDC, is located at Schreiber Air Force Base, Colorado. And it is an air, air, excuse me, space defense operations center which leverages unity of effort between interagency and intelligence community to protect and defend critical space capabilities from terrestrial based and co orbital counter space threats. The Joint Navigation Warfare Center, JNWC, is located at Kirtland Air, Air Force Base, New Mexico, and enables space-based positioning, navigation, and timing security for the Department of Defense and Interagency Coalition partners. The Missile Warning Center, MWC, is located at Cheyenne Mountain Air Force Station, Colorado, and it coordinates, plans, and executes worldwide missiles, nuclear detonation, and space re-entry event detection to provide timely accurate and unambiguous strategic warning in support of the United States and Canada. Along with these operations, along with these operations center, the Forest Service component commands fulfill an important role in training, equipping, and resourcing the forces necessary to carry out JFSC's mission. The Air Force has the Air Force Space Command. The Army has the Army Strategic Command. Navy has the Naval Fleet Forces Command. And the Marine has the Marine Forces Strategic Command. And these four service components, roles, and functions will be preferred into the brief. Pending any questions, I'll be followed by Lieutenant Wally. Um, all of, all of their, uh, Good morning, everyone. I'm first Lieutenant Wally. Uh, and today I will brief about the roles and the function. Uh, for the roles, we have the function, uh, which is uh, missile warning, which is ground-based uh, uh, radars provide uh, theater and strategic uh, plastic missile uh, warning. Secondly, uh, for the communication, uh, which is a con constant uh, global connectivity, uh, connectivity, uh, connect connectivity, and uh, third one, navigation, which is uh, GPS 28. Uh, satellite system provide timing and navigation uh, support to the force uh, and uh, we have a weather which is uh, mean uh, global weather data and we have also uh, a memory and uh, signal uh, surveillance information operations which is uh, space uh, operators coordinate 
uh, space uh, based imagery between intelligence agency and planners within uh, unified uh, commands. And also we have a space port which is launching and operating uh, satellites and monitoring uh, telemetry uh, and tracking uh, stats of the equipment. And also we have the force enhancement which is a satellite communications, uh, navigation, weather, uh, missile warning, and intelligence for DOD. And also we have space control defense, which is assuring the uh, US uh, super party and uh, freedom to operate in space environment and uh, defend uh, against enemy raids to satellite uh, infrastructures. For all of uh, these branches, Air Force and Army and Navy, uh, basically we can say, uh, say as a DOD manager for space-related human and technology miss missions, and uh, also uh, they plans uh, and directives coordinate and control assigned space assist for use across the DOD and insurance uh, technological. Advantage over uh, diversity, diversity uh, and space operations, and also uh, enhance uh, DOD capability to the war fighter. Thank you. I will be followed. Good morning, sir. I'm President Gary. Today I'll brief about the planning considerations. Uh, space presents uh, unique planning and operational considerations that may affect the uh, friendly, adversary, and natural uh, species forces alike. So, uh, space capabilities require extensive and advanced planning, and they might take into consideration global access, uh, persistence, limitations, resource considerations, vulnerability, legal, timing, and uh, Supporting plans. Uh, about, uh, let's see a short uh, interview for each of them. Uh, about uh, global access, the fact that there is uh, no geographical uh, boundaries or any physical obstruction in the space, it uh, gives to military forces. Um, it gives to military forces a global access and uh, extensive uh, advantages. They have a sufficient number of satellites in the appropriate orbit, which uh, may remain the the which may remain to provide the remain the, the line of the site and um, it gives um, and it it means that they have access in any point of the surface of the earth. About the persistence, um, it is a geostationary orbit that uh, allows a satellite to that allows a satellite to remain over the same area for 20 hours uh, a day and it provides continuum access to a given territorial area of influence and um, However, this geostationary orbit doesn't uh, have the, the high resolution in high attitude region. Uh, limitations uh, on the operating lifetime of a satellite, uh, it might include like um, the, the design lag of satellite is the maintenance and refueling, which the last two cannot be performed while they are in orbit, and the type of orbit used by a spacecraft, uh, as well as I can mention even the space weather. Uh, as resource considerations, it takes a long time to replace or to replenish uh, space assets. So this may limit the time that the commander is required for. And different organizations have to organize the appropriate of space capabilities, and so priorities will be validated. Uh, higher priorities will be first that will be uh, satisfied. Vulnerability, there are all segments that might be vulnerable to inter intercept or attack. Uh, this segment will be, might be uh, attacked or intercepted by um, direct action, by testing, um, otherwise like a, a laser blinding. As legal, uh, joint forces should be... Uh, joint forces complies with uh, US policies and US laws as well as uh, they, they complies with the uh, US ratified uh, treaties and the international laws when they have to plan to make uh, operation, space operations. Um, and about timing, 
uh, it is uh, dependent on the precise timing of capabilities, and this uh, precise timing can uh, enable information to flow to increase the effect used of the bandwidth, and uh, this might uh, it might allow for the the frequency swapping and cryptographic function to go into some uh, functions in the same communication system. Uh, they refer to the Annex N, usually the DOT, so while they are planning any uh, operation on the space. If there is no question, it will be followed by Captain Moore. All right, I'm Captain Moore. I'm going to be briefing the capabilities for space operations. If I could go back to you, uh, we'll play the video, which ties directly into space capabilities. Well, I have housed everybody in it um, with all my equipment work, so I've got a solid GPS feed, but everything is, is secure and working the way it is. Uh, I'm going to be the most lethal guy out there. The art of turns, though, is more on the aspect that they know that we can detect something from Russia, North Korea, China, and our certain coverage area. So this radar, using our system, we can track something the size of a softball at 3,000 miles a mile. Search and rescue should be easy in a combat environment. The guy wants to be found, wants to get out of there. If you're isolated on the ground, you're probably scared, but we're on a little bit of afraid. Uh, now we can send messages back to that person to reassure them, let them know that something is going on in the background to help them get out. I've had soldiers turn around and ask me, like, hey, do you have good comms? Or do you, do you, do you put the work and I'll say yes, and then they'll literally smile because they know that they're going to be safe and they're going to be fine. Having that advantage, it, yeah, it absolutely kind of gives you a little bit of cockiness in, in a good way, in a more good way, because no one's going to do anything to us when all those things are up. First of all, let's first priority with any JPEG, whether it's back to the economic controls or best practice side. So the biggest thing something like GPS does is I know where everybody is, and it takes something the size of watch and not every soldier knows exactly where they are. They don't even need to know what those numbers mean, they just need to tell them to me, and I don't know where they are. You see it like the word last 15 years, you're doing these danger close attacks where it's the other side of the street or the next building over. Uh, the precision that we have now is so much more important than it was. If you look at you know, World War II, where it takes 20,000 you know, bombs to hit a target, now today if it's one weapon, one kill, to increase standoff and reliability. All right, so that was a pretty cool video to show the capability of using satellites and space operations to affect uh, the battlefield. As signal leaders, it's especially important to us because as you heard him say, you know, hey, if we have good comms, uh, that's going to translate to us having, you know, devastating effects on the battlefield. So for capabilities, the U.S. operates under the control theory. This can be traced all the way back to the Cold War where we had the space race with Russia, uh, trying to... Uh, get ahead of the game, get the technological advantage, get into space. That way we can control space. Uh, therefore, we control the technological advancements, the surface of the earth, we control the skies, uh, and we can control the battlefield on the ground. So as you just saw in the video, it provides the U.S. with the military capabilities to essentially do all of those five things. So really, what is the so what of that? So we have the technological airspace, ground intelligence, and political superiority uh, over our adversaries. And we also give that capability to our coalition partners. Uh, essentially, this is all just compiled up to be a force multiplier for our force. So we're gonna go through, there's actually, uh, these are these uh, capabilities that are uh, listed out in the manual for uh, space operations. So. Uh, when you think space situational awareness, um, just think, hey, we have the ability to see what people are doing across the entire globe through our use of satellites. Uh, we have the ability to track asteroids, which if you've ever seen any disaster movie, you know, military people are freaking out trying to send a rocket to blow up an asteroid and save the Earth. Uh, it's actually listed that we are charged with uh, trying to find extraterrestrial uh, events that happen as well. So that's another capability that space operations is tasked with. Uh, information superiority, so just think GPS, uh, the Army uses, or the military in general uses a 28 satellite system array uh, to create redundancy. So if one satellite goes down, we still have others in geospatial orbit uh, to assist and to backfill that other one that goes down. Precision weapons delivery, you just heard him say, hey, we had to drop 20,000 bombs in World War II to level a city, whereas now 
you know, someone with a laser guided precision weapon can point that laser on a target and a F-22 Raptor can fly and drop one bomb and kill who we're trying to kill. This uh, eliminates collateral damage, civilian casualties, stuff like that. So huge, huge thing uh, capability wise for the DOD. Imagery, uh, you know we all use maps, uh, very precision oriented. So you can fly a satellite over one day and then the next day fly it over and you can see tank tracks and then you can say, hey, the enemy's moving, we know where they're moving, we know where they went at what speed. So that it provides that capability as well. Uh, force enhancement, so again, surveillance, reconnaissance, missile tracking, launch, dete launch detection, stuff that's huge now with North Korea, Russia, shooting missiles and stuff like that. Uh, support, so space operations, they support the space lift and delivery of rockets into space. Uh, they also monitor those high value assets, they do the electronic maintenance on them, and they try to reconstitute those space assets that have either been diminished or lost. Uh, and lastly, so control. So think about control, prevention. So if we have the assets to control space, we're going to have political superiority over people. So whereas before people were doing nuclear testing and building these facilities above ground, well, we have the capability to see what they're doing. So now North Korea is doing testing underground and all these other foreign powers who are doing illegal stuff, building nuclear reactors, they're all going underground to do this because they know we can see what they're doing. And lastly, we can control the battlefield. We have freedom of maneuver if we know what the enemy is doing. Um, and we can essentially cut our losses or prevent losses on our own force by knowing where the enemy's at and how much capability they have so we can meet it with greater, greater superiority or just not take the fight at all. Uh, pending any questions, I'll be followed by Senator Good morning, the limitations of space operations. The first thing, the limited capability to control satellites once they are in orbit. Once deployed and in the orbit, the, the uh, satellite's position is relatively predictable because the orbit is predictable. However, over time, natural force.